to take it. Don't get too taken up with the uh, fertilizer. Um, everything needs fertilizer to go, grow, got it. And so um, I'm gonna run through some of that as well. There's a few, few people out there saying you don't need fertilizers, but I went down that track and it cost me dearly. So um, we'll, we're gonna talk about all that today um, as we go along. So if you've got questions, I can't see the chat box or you can put your hand up Kayla or, or whatever. So yeah, so we'll get started. <clears throat> so Heather and I, um, cow calf operation, west of Crossfield. Um, we're a total year round grazing operation. Um, we're uh, winter swath grazing from November till early April. Then we go on to stockpile forage. But this year, due to the drought last year, I had to buy some bales in and uh, round bale feed um, in bale grazing, um, which is the first time we've done that for quite a number of years. Um, so we're very liquid in what we do. We, we can change track pretty quick um, with uh, what we do um, and, uh, and trying to bet, get the best, best bang for our buck. Um, we both work off farm, which is unfortunate for agriculture, where we uh, have to have someone on the farm going off farm to feed the farm family while someone stays at home to feed the world. So we've got to change that system somehow and put more value on our food that we produce. But uh, today, well, I'm just gonna take you down what I've learned so far with cover crops and where it's taken me um, uh, up until now anyway, but we're always learning. Oh no, so now that's not working. <coughs> now I'm seized. Oh, there you go, I'll do this. Okay, so, oh, there's a chat box up there, it's up the top. Um, so what drives our system here? It, it's, you know, it's something that you guys can use as a guideline. N not everything works in different locations. Um, so just kind of pick the basics and keep it simple. But this is kind of where we're going to talk about today. What drives our system? Um, how we can adapt and change and, and uh, make us more profitable on the farm by reducing inputs. Um, so diversity on our place where we rent most of our land. Um, I see my landlords on here tonight. So um, we have land out at Cochrane we rent. We've had that for quite a few years um, with Anne. And, um, and then we rent land at Airdrie and then we have the home place here. So mostly we carve here and then move uh, straight away out to rented pasture. We, we, we've got some great people we work with and they don't want us to overstock they want us to leave their pastures in good condition. So, so we're diverse in what we do. Our forages are diverse. I'm always changing my annual crops around for the situations I had. Um, I've normally got a, um, a diverse mix for winter swath grazing of, of rape and peas and turnips and triticale and oats, sunflowers. But this last year, weeds were getting ahead of me. So I just did uh, triticale and oats and I switched gears and I was out of the in-crop spray. So I, I won't let the weeds take over on, on our place. I've got to keep it under control. Um, cover crops um, limit us what we can use uh, on our, on our uh, spray application. So our perennial pastures, they are all uh, high legumes with um, sandpoint vetch alfalfa and our brome orchard softleaf tall fescue. So in um, eastern Alberta and Saskatchewan, we changed that up, still use the legumes, but more drought tolerant grasses out in there. So these little things can help change your operation by knowing what grows well in your area and use them um, to suit your programs. And then covers and companion crops, like I was just saying with our annuals and perennials, that changes all the time. It depends on the cost of things as well. Um, our perennials are pretty much stock standard with the three legumes and four grasses. Um, and like I said there earlier with our annuals, we're uh, always changing that up <clears throat> on depending on weed pressure, um, what the season's like. Um, I'm worried about this year. I'll probably just use forage rape, triticale and oats. I won't use too much more to keep the budget down um, for winter feeding. We're trying to keep our winter feeding costs to around a dollar to a dollar twenty-six a day um, to to make the winter program 
viable. Um, we rent all our uh, winter land. We do pay 80, 80 and $85 an acre, which is cheap around here, but that's a true cost for us. So if we can keep our input cost on the other end down a bit, um, I pencil myself in at uh, $35 an hour for, for winter work. Soil health, that's our main goal. It's something that pays off, but it doesn't pay off like we've been told in the past. Um, by not using fertilizers, I'm going to show you some really good um, pictures of that coming up in some video and some and some photographs that uh, I'm all about soil health. And, and before, in 2007, I wasn't interested in soil health. It wasn't a thing back then. I was into, into high nutrient dense forage. I wanted to feed the cattle as best I possibly could, both perennials and annuals. And uh, they're number one and get them fed properly and uh, putting on condition and, and conceiving calves as uh, at a really high rate. So I had to look after the balance of my nutrient nu nutrients in my forages. Um, livestock integration on the soil. I'll show you that here coming up. Um, how we need, it's not all about cover crops, the miracle that's going to save your soil. The big picture is the livestock. You cannot replace livestock on soil. The, they're, they're putting most of the nutrition down. The cover crops is a form of turning uh, green organic matter into fertility quicker through livestock. Sure enough, the roots and bulbs and legumes will all rot and um, fix nitrogen into the soil, rot and put organic matter. But if you want quick results, then the livestock is it. But I still use chemical fertilizers. And I'll show you some pictures and, and later on here of why I do that. I, I went off it and I'm back on it again. The water infiltration, I got some great um, photographs of that. Um, for 1% organic matter, we're going to add 45,000 litres of water holding capacity. So I'm all about saving water in the soil. Moisture efficiency, that's getting back into putting moisture in the soil for drought times. And then having that solar panel coming down <clears throat> from atmospheric energy, building the root systems, building a strong, healthy, robust root system, either perennials or annuals. The bigger root system we've got in a in a uh, um, an annual, the more organic matter we're going to uh, run into the soil. And the more organic matter, the wa more water holding capacity uh, in the soil. And then uh, letting it all work, letting the rest time. Some of my pastures only get grazed certain amount, certain amount of times through the year. Um, our, our soil in the summer for our swath grazing gets rested all summer. There's no livestock, but there's still a growing root in there getting ready to lay down. And the family time, um, uh, my threw this one in here is part of a regenerative system because without the family, you know, how can you put all this together? So, um, my idea of being together is not working together. We should be taking time out and playing together. And, and the one in red, which everybody seems to forget, financial management. We've got to make this work financially. Don't do it thinking you're going to save the planet. Don't do it because you think it's the best thing for the soil. Do it because you want to be more financial viable on your operation. So the, my calf costs... My calf prices is not what I chase. It's the bottom end of what it's going to cost me per day to feed those livestock 365 days a year. So that's the biggest thing to me. That's why it's in red is make sure it's financially viable for the, for the family operation. <clears throat> so this is my pyramid. Everybody has a pyramid lately. And I thought, well, I've got to have a pyramid too. So this is mine. Number one is family financing. Feed the cattle as best possible forage we can get. Um, and then the soil health is third. Soil health will knit in to the, to the middle one with the diversity of forages and the best quality feed that they can have and the, and the livestock manuring all over the soil and urinating on them. So this is, I think, keep it simple, stupid with this kind of thing. Keep the keep the vision there that I've got to be financially viable first, whatever I do. The second is the livestock, which make us money. We've got to look after them and feed them as efficiently as possible. 
and and for as cheaply as possible and then the feeding the soil at the same time as the feeding of livestock and the so the soil is last in my pyramid because i just if i went which i did go down that track as the soil the soil the soil and and i and it almost cost me and i've seen so many people in the past go down that way too where um where they didn't uh, keep an eye on finances. So by keeping it simple towards the soil health thing, let, using the least amount of mechanical disturbance, we zero till we don't harrow the trash after the, uh, after in the spring, like right now. Um, but I actually will be doing one piece because the deer got in it and took all the oats off the heads and, and the cattle didn't eat it. So I will be doing some mechanical work on that here in the next couple of weeks. So, but normally it's zero till, um, leaving litter on top of the soil um, for keeping it cool, keeping the evaporation to minimum, um, but also feeding the, the biology in the soil, the worms and, and the biology that are coming up. By end of July, I can't find any litter on top of my soil. It's just all gone. It, it's like it happens overnight, but it doesn't. It just takes its time. And you can see all the wormholes coming up and you've seen the videos, the worms pulling straw and leaf matter into the soil. And I've got some photographs of some um, fungi on top of the soil eating the litter as well coming up. Keeping the living root as long as possible. Here in Canada, we're pretty much, uh, unless it's a perennial stand, which does go dormant, but um, we're pretty much limited to sweet clovers and winter cereals for an annual. <laughs> Um, to keep that living root, but they're all going dormant. They're all going to sleep. They're not uh, uh, wasting energy trying to keep alive. So, you know, if we've got a winter trit, um, sweet clover mix in there, it's gone dormant over the winter, but you'll kick in early in the spring. So that's having that little um, living root there getting in early. And then, like I say, integrating livestock there back onto the soil and with the nutrient recycling. So at home, this is in New Zealand because I didn't have any photographs back then of home, but we used to use brassicas a lot. And I came to Canada and thought, you know, I'll do the Canadian thing. And I forgot about brassicas. And um, it was 16 years ago, we went home. We went through New Zealand on the way back to Australia. And I called into our friends there on the South Island, David Biggs, and it revitalized my thought about um, brassicas again. So we started bringing them up in 2007 just for ourselves um, it's part of our winter program down there which makes it perfect for here because they're a cool season crop that do really really well um, they can handle a bit of dry weather but when it does rain they do absolutely gangbusters lately i've heard um, on the internet and stuff that brassicas too much brassicas are bad for cattle or livestock that, that's a load of hooey. It's not. The, the more, the better. You've got to watch it with um, dairy animals because it will taint the milk, the brassica. Um, but as far as putting condition on and cheap feed, you can't, you can't beat it. They're really high nutrient dense forage that can grow back fairly rapidly, depends on the species you're using. So um, I would grow straight brassicas. Um, to to lay down for winter swaths one day i might try that and see how it goes but don't be taken in by um too many brassicas are bad for livestock they're not and i'll show you down the line here what we have to look at when you do have a lot of brassicas um, there are some watch outs for sure this is my uh, friend in scotland he grows grows uh rape and turnips for his fattening cattle and that's all he grows. He's not worried about soil health. He's worried about pounds per day. Um, very intense operation. Both the Scots and the Kiwis um, really manage their land really hard. So you can see in the background here where the cattle have been. By the time he gets halfway through the paddock, he's going to be putting a, a Italian rye grasses or um, winter cereals in behind here um to graze so the cattle get down to the far end and they'll come back up to the north end and they'll start grazing back through again so he's got a lot of manure happening those turnip bulbs in the back here will start rotting down and uh putting organic matter into rob's soil so we talked about you know the soil being 
the num um, being the hub and being the bed of all our uh, programs on top. This is what it, this is what my goals are. At the end of the in the end of the winter, I want to see all this litter and manure all over the soil. The reason I want to see that is because I want to start feeding these as cheap as possible. And I thought I could get away. You can't see the urine spots. So imagine what you see here with manure. If you saw urine spots as here as well, if you could see them, how much fertility we've got on those soil. So we just seed straight through all that. We, we don't go and till it or, or harrow it or anything. Um, but I want to get this litter here, feeding the root systems here. And I thought this would be able to do it. And it did it. And I'll show you some pictures in a little bit. It did it up to a point, then it, then it started uh, caving in. So this piece of land here, remember this um, swath grazing land, we've been on there since um, 2000 and through, no, 2004 and five winter here. Um, and that's how much every year we get this much litter and this much manure and urine on the soil to try and feed the root systems in here, which is our goal to keep the cost down. So remember this picture here and I'm gonna show you in a couple of slides in the future here to, to show you what's um, what happened. So we all heard of mycorrhizal fungi and the nitrogen rhizobia bacteria ficking nitrogen into our legumes. We were the first company in North America to put mycorrhizal and rhizobia on every seed, even brassicas. Brassicas will not host mycorrhizal or rhizobia um, because um, it's a, well, it's a brassica, it's a, it's a bulb like canola, um, big tap root in, root in it, doesn't have fine hairs off it. So, but by putting that onto the seed itself, it'll find an adoption. So this oats plant's now swath grazing. And this was dug up by Nicole Masters quite a few years ago. Um, and how do we know we've got mycorrhizal in the soil? That oats was not treated with mycorrhizal, but because of the brassicas, I had turnips, forage rape, and a and a forage turnip in that in that particular era swath grazing with the 4010 peas. But that's how I was told we can tell because of the glumming on of the soil to the to the root system. We can't see mycorrhizal with the naked eye, but it's a symbiotic relationship. The plant here is giving it sugars. So um, the mycorrhizal is a, um, oh, a parasite that hangs on to the roots, but what the mycorrhizal do is bringing micronutrients back into the plant that it can use to be a healthier standard above the soil. So they're getting the atmospheric energy from here, photosynthesizing it, putting it into its roots, which it needs anyway with the sugars to grow, but also the bacteria, the, the parasite, mycorrhizal is coming on here and then sucking um, the sugars out but it's transferring micronutrients back into the plant so we started doing that about five years ago and, and it, it's working pretty good and then um, as, as you all know with them with the rhizobia bacteria on on your seed make sure when you buy seed ask them is all your clovers or your peas or your hairy vetches inoculated um, and make sure it is because otherwise you're putting them in the soil for no benefit but to have uh, forage up top okay so keep that in mind when you're talking so this is what our soil looks like um, it's this is early in the spring it's still wet um, and glummy it's not dried out enough to be flaky um, but I always get the question how do I know I've got healthy soil I, I don't know. You can smell it. It smells organic. It smells he healthy. Um, you can send it away to a lab uh, and get it tested. It'll come back and it'll tell you exactly what your soil is, your biologicals. But if you're just going out in the soil and digging up a lump like this, if you've got the worms in there in this kind of number, you know you're on the right track. You can go and spend your money, which we do every second year. We send a, a soil samples to get a biological done um, and NPKS but I think this is the simple little you know get a shovel go around and dig your soil I was digging in Saskatchewan today um, around Saskatoon and there was no 
um, couldn't find a worm anywhere. But the land had been very, very uh, heavily farmed, a lot of anhydrous, so the soil is stale. But this is a real simple guideline for all you guys to check out. And um, if you can find worms, you're on the right track. And you can see through here all the organic matter that's starting to rot into the soil as well. So, and you've got old rotting root systems through here. So these big guys here are going to start chewing all that up and add, adding aggregate into your soil. This is, this, these two pictures annoy the hell out of me. Um, the, there's companies out there that use, you know, you've got to have root diversity in your soil. Does anybody notice anything with these? This is pictures. They're someone's interpretations. They're cartoons. Um, uh, cartoons. Um, my wife's trying to call me. She's down checking cards. Uh, um, so someone's interpretation. This one up here is from New Zealand. This one is used here in Canada, but it's from Cotswold Seeds in the Cotswolds in the Midlands of England. I've been to this company. Um, but one example here, you've got chicory right here in the middle. And then, so the root systems, the fibrous root system, and here's someone else's interpretation right there. That's their interpretation of chicory. Okay, and same with, with the clovers. Um, you've got uh, white clover here, okay. Um, white clover has a huge root system. These clovers that we're using here, there's another clover there, in their countries of origin, they are perennials. So they can get really big over time. So we need time for them to grow to reach their full potential. But in Canada, they're always going to be an annual because of the winter they'll die out. So if you have someone come along and say, you know, this is what our root systems do, and it's something like this, you better question it and take a shovel out and go and dig it up for yourself, okay? And then find out what it's really like under there. So this was taken last year. Okay, we'll go back to here. There's um, uh, plantain right there, chicory right there, and there's this guy's interpretation of chicory here. Okay, and don't forget, in England and New Zealand, these have got a lot longer growing periods than we have here in Canada. What we have to do in 90 days is phenomenal for all these plants. But over there, when they can, they can seed them, they can seed them in March. And then they're growing all through March, spring, right through uh, in the north here, right through to November, December. So they can get a way better root system on than, than we can um, here in Canada. So just take that into mind too. But if you want a big, robust root system, there's chicory right there up to 60 days. Bloody big system right there. And there's plantain there. So we get our chicory and plantain out of New Zealand. So the plantain has been domesticated. So it's an upright plantain, not a native plantain here, which is flat. Um, so plant, we're trying to get a, a, a plantain that will last up here because it is a perennial and same with the chicory here. So you can see I didn't get, I end up chopping these roots off. But if you want organic matter and a lot of it, you go and chuck a chicory in there in your blends and it'll, <clears throat> and it'll do a lot of work like a, um, a, a turnip or a um, forage rape will. This picture here is taken out at Linden at Jerry Berg's place. Um, we seeded crimson clover right here at the bottom and uh, 4010 forage peas. These are all seeded together. And the, the crimson clover, it, we buy that um, out of Chile. And it is a, a perennial crop that's harvested uh, every year from the same stand, just like alfalfa or sandfoin or vetch. Okay, so its first year of growing, it's not worried about putting nitrogen on its root system, little tiny root system. And here we have 4010 forage bees. They know they have to get up and grow, set their next generation seed on and put fertility in the soil for the next generation to go. Look at all the nitrogen nodules through these plants here. There's just tons of them growing in here. So if you're after a nitrogen fixing plant, just do peas only with a cereal or, or a rape or something like that. But if you want diversity and you want different grazing, 
sure, go ahead and use your clovers, your Persian, your bursting clover, crimson clover, but don't get into the thing that they're going to fix a not, lot of nitrogen for you because there's the proof right there. And it was very interesting digging up. So take a shovel along with your crops and dig them up. So this is hairy vetch right here on, on the left. Really rapid growing root system, tons of forage up top when it's allowed to express itself. And this is Italian ryegrass. So it's a little simple cover crop blend was these two right here, Italian ryegrass and hairy vetch. We did really well with that crop. It multiple grazed. It was under irrigation down at Fort McLeod. We got um, four grazing off it before it froze in and we seeded it early in uh, mid-April. Oh no, yeah, no, it was end of April, um, end of April, early May. Um, but it was under irrigation, did very well. And we, we did, we got what we needed. We had to get a lot of organic matter in the soil. So we did it for a couple of years and we kept it simple like this. The reason why we put hairy vetch in there is the main crop was the Italian ryegrass, but we wanted options to go and spray. So this here, if we had to spray, it was taking out a couple of pounds of hairy vetch to control red root pigweed and dandelion. So it wasn't a huge loss, but this, these guys kept on growing. And you can see from one seed, that's one seed that's been grazed, grazed multiple times, the root mass in there, a really shallow, but a lot of fibrous root in there so that's something you know a simple cover crop that can work um, especially when you have to consider spraying so we're talking about root systems right now so from every one of these is one seed produces this much biomass and a root system okay so we'll start over here on the right so that's goliath forage rate multiple grazing it's registered cattle feed all these are registered for cattle feed um, huge root system. You can see this one's hit a hard pan, but there is some roots that are starting to crack through that hard pan. Most roots, except for alfalfa, it, it uh, start going sideways at about uh, 280 PSI, which isn't a lot on a, on a probe. Um, so if you can get a tap-rooted brassica like this that can find its way down, then it can start putting that deeper organic matter into the soil. These, these two plants here can be grazed multiple kinds. This is hunter forage turnip. This was bred by the Kiwis. Um, what they've done is added more leaf and taken out the bulb. So here we've got a bulb turnip. You can see the leaf matter here. These were taken out halfway, um, well, halfway past summer, halfway through summer. These bulbs in the fall can be as big as your head. But what they've tried to do here is get more foliage that we can graze multiple times but what they've done is kept this growing crown below the soil. So the cattle can come and really nail this, but it won't affect the growing point right here. Um, so, the, so if we had these and the, the bulbs, as you know, are half out of the ground, we have to manage these a lot more. And if they take that growing crown out of any of these, a green globe or a purple top turnip, then that plant's done. So what the Kiwis did is, is made a tuber, a long carrot-like, you know, taken the tuber out, the bowl bound made a tuber with like a long carrot. So we can graze. And here we have um, oats and triticale. And then, as I said, green globe turnip and uh, purple top. So it's amazing how one seed from all these varieties, the different biomasses. So that's why having a bit of diversity in there, these, plants here, if they were by themselves as well, um, eating green, they'd pass through an animal like nothing else. So unless you're using electric fence and controlling the grazing, but if you have some fiber in there and the right balance of fiber with the cereals, then you can slow that rumen down. So they're utilizing most of the forage that, they, um, that they're consuming. Um, this doesn't apply too much right now. Um, everybody says, used to say, I want a brassica in my forage. The brassica family, it's a Latin word for the brassica family. So we've got our cauliflowers and cabbages and kales, rutabakas, um, uh, root, um, sure, um, beets. So, uh, um, 
that's that they're all belonging to this family here, into this into the Swedes and forage rapes, turnips, tillage radish, kales, and canola. But when you're asking for a, uh, a brassica, keep to these kind of ones here, except for this one. Um, there's out, there's people using uh, stuff like collards, which collards is not even registered as livestock. It's a vegetable that you put in stews down in, in the South Americas and also the South of the US. Um, it, it can't handle too much pressure from grazing. It'll get, come back maybe once, but not rapidly. So just think about, okay, I want to get the best bang for our buck. So keep to these families here. Some people are putting these two guys into a brassica. They're not, they're a forb. So these are not a brassica, chicory and plantain. They're a forb. They're very high in mineral and trace elements. Um, so keep them separate when you're looking at what you're doing for a blend. Okay, these are the kind of ones that really work um, up here. But you don't want all these together. You want them to be able to express themselves separately. So um, the hairy vetches can, I've seen it grow everywhere in dry land. I've seen it grow in wet. Um, we have to be very careful with hairy vetch. Too much in it, the, it uh, the seeds are toxic. So you can't, if you let it go right through till fall, um, the, uh, um, you're gonna kill cattle. And we had an incident, uh, uh, friends of ours, uh, colony up in um, Wanham, they put too much hairy vetch in their blend from somewhere and um, they lost 10 head in seven days so that they can get, um, I think it's alkaloid toxicity from the pod seeds. Um, so if you're going to make your own blend, keep it down to about 10, 15% hairy vetch in your blend. Um, then you've got your 4010Ps. We talked about real robust, but it can only handle one grazing, right? So it's best if you use it for fall stockpile forage or winter swath grazing, because once that, plants shoot off, she's not coming back. And then your crimson clovers, bursim and Persian clovers right here. Um, great forage, uh, pretty drought tolerant, the Persian clover. But these guys in their countries of origin, like I said earlier, they start, um, once it gets frozen, they're not coming back again. They don't like a lot of competition. So balance your forages, your blend out. So everything has room to express itself. And then you've got your C4s, sunflower should be back up here, but your millet and your sorghums, really good in drier areas in, in Southern Alberta and Northern Montana, Southern Saskatchewan and um, into Manitoba. But if you do get rain, these guys will just go absolutely gangbusters for you. Um, they'll perform like nothing else. Something that um, the sorghums and the, uh, uh, Winfred and Goliath forage rape have in common is a survival mechanism. When it turns dry, sorghums, especially sorghums and the forage rapes, they go dormant. They just shut down, they stop growing, and they wait for rain. And um, they'll just they'll just vegetate. And when they get rain, they'll just, just blow. They'll explode. You'll see there on the rapes, their leaves will start going down and that's to conserve moisture and stop trans evaporation out of their leaves. And in the mornings, you'll see them back up again and through the day, they'll drop down again. And until they get rain, they'll do that. And then all of a sudden, about 35 days, they'll just start dying. But if we get rain, then they'll go. Unlike your cereals and canolas, who they don't get rain, but they know they have to reproduce. So they start you know, your, your canola or your, your oats or barley can be, you know, a foot or two high and they're drought stressed, but they'll start setting flower um, and then losing quality on the forage too. So that's something that the, the sorghums and the Winfred and Goliaths have got is this survival mechanism in there to, to help them through dry times. And then the graza is a, is a grazing radish. It's not a tillage radish. It's got a massive big bulb on it. It's bitter, um, just like daikon radish, um, but it has a lot, a lot of organic matter. The foliage is okay. It tastes like um, a Tabasco sauce kind of thing. Um, the cattle will go for it, but if you want organic matter in your soil, 
um, for not a lot of money. These guys are really good. They don't grow long like this. They grow big um, triangular bulbs on them. So they do really well. And then, of course, your cereals. You know, we can't underestimate these guys. Even if you put peas and a, and a forage rape and then some cereal in there, that's a great forage mix there. You're going to have diversity. It'll work for you. So we're going to go through some of the advantages now and we'll go through some of the disadvantages. Um, like I said there earlier, we can graze multiple times through the season with most of these, except for your peas and your sunflowers. Um, once they've been grazed once, they're not going to come back again. Um, the sorghums, you have to be very careful with under two feet tall. They uh, parasitic acid is an issue with them, but after that, they're good to go. We used to graze a lot of sorghum in Australia for fattening cattle, um, and we knew our limits. Um, so something like that can be kept an eye on. Um, a lot of organic matter by the diversity of the root systems in the soil. Uh, all can handle cool seasons, even the sorghums we're getting now, they're about a 60 day sorghum, a smaller growing period. Even the corns now, we're getting a less heat units, shorter growing season. So these kind of things can be implemented on your, on your operations as well. And really, really high digestibility, which I'm, which I'm really aiming for. We want the best quality feed we can get with our, uh, with our uh, annual forages. Quick growing, if you're looking you know, at grazing something early, um, if you put a hunter in Italian ryegrass or hairy vetch in Italian ryegrass, after seeding, it's about 40 days, or chicory and plantain in Italian ryegrass, um, mostly in high moisture areas, you can be growing, um, you know, four to six weeks, and then you can be grazing it in about 20 to 25 days after its first initial grazing, so rotational grazing. It's a really... The, the, the Italian ryegrass, if you've got irrigation or if you've got um, high moisture area, that's going to be one of your um, biggest bang for your buck with root systems under the soil, but a lot of grazing above the soil and, and can take a caning. And it's really good if you're um, putting livestock manure on the soil and um, uh, like feedlot manure and something like that, it'll use up a lot of nutrient, nitrogen, um, and FOSS runoff, it'll use it into the plants. We're doing that at JBS um, in Brooks right now. Um, so, uh, but the forage is, is some of the best grass forage you, you'll, you'll ever get and the cattle do really well on it. But you've got the options of uh, in-crop spray. So with the feedlot manure or the cattle manure coming out of your crowls, you always have these root um, uh, weed problems. Something like, like Italian would work really well for you too. Um, if you don't have that uh, weed issues and the chicories and the clovers to do, do really well with the Italians. Um, livestock won't hesitate. They'll sniff around. What I used to do when I first started, I'd fence off a little bit so they, would, they wouldn't be walking all over as big a fenced off area as I'd normally give them. And I'd make them eat that, everything in that area before I moved a fence. But now those cattle, they go through the Swaths looking for the brassicas and the turnip bulbs and so on and so on. Um, they can be sod seeded. I haven't had a lot of success with that. So I would put oats and trit in if you're not going to turn your sod. Um, just put oats and trit in for the first year. You might want to put sweet clover in, but I think it's too costly going to put a cover crop in. Um, I have a custom seeding business as well, and I've done this with some friends of out of Cochrane and ourselves, and we didn't see the bang for our buck by putting a cover crop into sod seed, um, into sod land. We didn't see any rejuvenation. We saw the plants stunted because of the root system that's underneath the soil is restricting that seedling, trying to get, get ahead and get an advantage over them. Most of these crops don't like wet soil. Um, so make sure she's well-drained soil, just like if you're seeding canola or, or barley, um, and then can handle a wide variety of pH levels too. So that covers your park plans right down through the black soil through here in Alberta and Saskatchewan. You can, if we've got rain, you can grow pretty much any one of these. Um, and then different um, 
pounds per acre, you know, depends what you're seeding. It doesn't take a lot. Um, for winter swath grazing, $5.50 a, a pound and using five pounds of brassicas. And then you're using some uh, oats and triticale or whatever else. But it, you can stack that bill as, as deep and as high as you want because the more you put in there, the more it's going to cost. So when, when you're hearing guys saying, you know, we've got 15, 16 things, I, I wouldn't go for that. I said, well, I want less because I want everything to express itself. And not everything that's going to go in there is going to take it take advantage of growing because it's not fast enough growing. So just keep that in mind. You know, two things might be all you need, but six or seven would be the top end for me. Um, we talked about the organic, uh, adding organic matter and watering holding capacity helps improve the biodiversity. Um, cattle in rotation. So have it, I've got a slide from Bart Lardner. We'll show that on the soil fertility, what a livestock brings back to your soil. And then the good, you know, if you, if you had a cereal and you had a legume and a brassica and a C4, you know, that would be a really good base to start and then work your budget and say, okay, this is $34 an acre and I can feed the cattle for a buck a day. That's where I want to be. Then every time you stack on top of that, it's going to go from 35 to 37 to 40 and so on and so on. So watch the budget. And most importantly, make sure it's the best quality feed we can have for the livestock. This is the soil um, on the same place, but later on in the season. So you can see how granular and aggreg aggregated that soil is. And it is holding moisture like nothing else. And this is the next picture. So this is the same soil. That's that soil there. And this is a rain event we had one night. We got four inches overnight. It hasn't happened for a while. I think this is in 2018 or 17. But our property is here, the, the rented land for the winter swath grazing. And this is right across the road. Conventional, no fence, just canola barley rotations. They do do the silage now. Actually, they do put corn in there now. But before, it was just straight uh, canola cereal rotation. But you can see we've got some ponding here. And we've got some water starting to flow here, but in general, we've taken most of that moisture and put it into the soil here. And you can see, even though that's aggregated, you can see it's damp, but we've been able to hold that moisture back, even on the highlands here. It hasn't run down as much as what it has here. This property here has been in Heather's family for 115 years, and we've managed it. Um, for winter grazing for the last probably 15 years. This same picture here was the same rain event at another neighbor. Um, we always use neighbors photographs, but you know, I do use other guys' photographs that look good too, not always just bad ones. So this is, you can see the brome grass here, how rapidly that water came flowing off here, just flattened the brome grass. All this litter has been banked up and topsoil has been rushed down here, down the road. I don't know why people don't get worried about this. It just worries me that we takes thousands of years to do this and it takes one night to flood it out and carry on. And same with this guy farming the other side of the trees, just tilling and tilling and tilling. And he doesn't even care about, this is west of Strath, east of Strathmore how much topsoil and value he's leaving on top of his soil. So that's why using less mechanical, you know, and not tilling your soil, there's nothing then there. And remember I was showing you that photograph with all the manure and the litter on top? This is that same paddock and you can hardly see any of it there now um, because it's all gone in. So this guy here is just tilling away. Okay, so this is a silage crop down at Catalan's feedlot. <clears throat> It was, this isn't, it had a, another a month to go. This is under irrigation. Um, so it's just a simple barley brassica mix um, with some Italian ryegrass. You can just see the Italian ryegrass merging here, right there. Um, there's a little bit in here and there's some right there. But anyway, so that went off for silage and here's the same paddock um, at the end of the season. So Italian ryegrass has started filling in. The brassicas uh, after harvest 
for the silage harvest. They kick back in again and some regrowth of the barley as well. So, you know, we can do simple things. This is what I'm trying to get into you guys. It doesn't need to be a rocket science blend to do this. It could be just a couple of three varieties in there can get us this kind of grazing late into the season. Okay. Here's some, here's some disadvantages. Um, watch, watch the amount of clovers in your, in your, uh, in your blends. Cause it just like every other legume, well, not every legume, size of milk vetch and, and, um, and Glenview sand foins, they don't bloat, but your clovers, watch your amount of clovers so you're not bloating cattle. Uh, have a diverse mix in here with your, with your brassicas in there as well and, and their cereals. Um, hairy vetch, we talked about that can be toxic. Weed control is null and void. There's nothing we can do. So that's why this last winter, I just used cereals only so I could get in there and control um, those broadleaf weeds. Um, around Camrose and Wetaskiwin and up in that area there, club roots are a real issue. So once again, you can look at your plantains, chicories, clovers and tallions and cereals to get, go in something there. You don't have to use your brassicas. Um, brassicas are really bad in a uh, high sulfur area. So if you can smell sulfur in your water, or you don't put sulfur in your fertilizer because you've got enough, don't grow brassicas because the cattle will get polio. It swells the brain. And in the, the cattle, you'll notice them, they'll start walking in circles. Then they'll start pushing their head up against each other or posts. They, they've got a headache because their brain swelling. In about three days, they'll be dead. So watch the sulfur issue with this. Um, there's areas around acme that uh, you can't use that. There's uh, areas up in the piece that uh, is not great for brassicas. If you do, just put a pound or two, not like in a normal area, you can put five to six pounds because it can, it'll can it knock cattle really quick before you know it. Okay, like we talked before, um, don't like wet, soil, uh, wet feet, um, so keep them out of your sluey area. Um, and make sure you feed test. I feed test every year, both my perennials and my annuals, and I get a mineral made up exactly for what that needs. Um, to get the best bang for your buck, you need your mineral packages as well, right? So make sure you, you get a, I'm not a big fan on off your shelf mineral. It usually works out cheaper if they're blending for what you need is um, you, you, you're not getting what they think you need. So you're able to keep the cost down a bit. Nitrates is huge, um, especially if you've um, put a lot of feedlot manure on your place. We, we've had that happen at Catalans. Um, the cattle were on the brassicas and the cover crop mixes all summer under pivots, no problems at all. The first frost on September 16th, we lost two overnight. Um, so that was 10,000 pounds of feedlot manure on there. So we, we should have washed it a little little more than what we did so make sure you know the the nitrates are, are managed properly you know know what you put down there is a rapid test now coming out that you can it's a farm thing you can have on farm the um leo and sean and the guys up at uh, olds colleges is playing around with that right now um testing these different um on farm nitrate testers so keep that in, in mind with the nitrates. Flea beetles last year was a wreck. Man, with all this canola being grown right now, it's unbelievable the amount of flea beetles that's happening. So keep an eye on flea beetles. You might have to use matador or something to keep under control, but they won't stay away. They'll come back. Um, so, and don't fall for the no fertilizer hype. This is, I've seen so much failures. I've done it myself. Um, there's some wrecks out there and really bad. And when guys have to go and buy in feed um, at these high hay prices, treat your soil, uh, test your soil and treat it accordingly to what fertilizers. We've dropped our fertilizer bill and I'll show you some slides coming up, but I'll never eliminate, I'm not using fertilizer. I, I went down there, oh, it's cost me big time. And this is what happens. So. The history of this paddock here, um, we started uh, 
we had cattle on there since about 2003, 2004. We started using um, uh, cover crops or nutrient dense forage is what we thought it is. It, cover crops wasn't a trendy thing back then. Um, and so all I had was rape and um, triticale and oats, and that was it. I wanted high, high nutrient dense forage to carry those cattle through. And so in 2015, I stopped using fertilizer. I'd been to the conferences, I'd listened to the experts, and I'd been doing this for quite a while on the same piece of land. So I thought, great, this is my key out of here. Um, and so this is seeded in first week in May, um, 15, 16, 17, really great crops unbelievable i thought this was the beginning beginning of the buckets of money um and then 18 it kind of dropped off and then 19 this happened so these are all urine spots and manure spots in the field that piece around the back of this is 45 days growth this right here is 45 days growth so i sent these photographs to the expert down in the US and said, what's happening here? And he told me, it looks like you need nitrogen fertilizer. And I said, yeah, no shit, really? So I, I um, the afternoon I took these photos, I, I called the co-op up the road here, they blew some fertilizer on. Um, and then I waited and watched. So see this 20th of July, this is the 29th of July in the same paddock 54 pounds of n went on there and recovered that crop like nothing else so now this is why soil tests are so important to me now um, because i want to know what i need and right now all i'm down is just nitrogen i don't need anything else i have an independent guy who helps me out here an agronomist um, keeps me on track so remember that do your soil tests and don't be falling into this trap. Our crops don't need fertilizer. It might work on remnants of fertility from previous years, but it's going to bite you in the ass and we can't afford to go broke in the middle of winter. So see this canola land, the other side of the coolie here, I'm going to show you two soil tests. There's this one here. Um, uh, just remember these two paddocks. Okay. Um, so one with the nitrogen and one with the full-blown canola. It's the same farm, but it's farmed differently. Um, we we um, There's a guy who rents this office. Um, but anyway, but I'll show you the soil test. So this video shows in this paddock here, I left an area with no nitrogen fertilizer. So um, that's where I didn't fertilize. Okay. So that's that. And this is where I did fertilize. Okay. So that's what I'm saying to you is we need the best possibly result, possible results we can get. This is still way cheaper than buying bales at $147 a bale for green feed. So keep those two thoughts in mind here um, about your fertility, always measure it and uh, keep that under control. We can cut costs but cutting costs isn't taking fertility out when you've got to go and buy green feed or hay okay so you can see the density in that okay so this is the canola i was talking to you about it had no livestock impact on the soil and this is the crop okay it's really lacking nitrogen and you all know that nitrogen is so movable that either gases off or leaches out with rain um, so that's why we're down to just using a bit of end to get things going and the plants can get strong and, and start mining what they have in the soil so our npk uh, um, pks is really strong calcium mag um, we don't have to worry about it so the soil must be strong because look at these are almost identical um, so it must be naturally in the soil i'm not a i'm not an agronomist guy but it just shows that I might, this soil might be strong in um, calcium and mag, but having that livestock in there has really brought my fossil up, um, which 
um, we don't have. The FOSS right now is still over $1,000 a ton. So this is from Bart Lard. This is going to show you, I'll just open all these up. So this is the Western Beef Development Center over there um, in Saskatchewan, Saskatoon. Um, Bart's done these studies of what an animal puts down into your soil, okay? So an average 1,400 pound cow, you know, it shits out 65 pounds a day, urinates 20. And this is what we're getting for N and P coming out of the, out of the livestock back into the soil. And so you calculate that out. And this is in controlled grazing, okay? Not just range management, which, you know, you can still see the results, but if you tuck it up tight, you can get it more fertility. So over a year, that animal um, through just the urine and the, and the manure, we're putting over um, 1,500 pounds of nitrogen down the soil. So the retention is over 1,000 pounds, okay? Or 106 pounds an acre. So that's something to keep thought of is uh, what those livestock can do under controlled graze. This is the flea beetles I was talking about from, from previous years. They just annihilate it. Look how big that plant is and it's just getting creamed. So that's a problem. We control. Um, this has got white cockle through it, as you can see. Can't do anything about it, but take it off as silage or green feed. Um, it take forever to turn into green feed. It took a while to turn into silage. So keep those things in mind. If you know the history of your paddocks and you can um, keep that you know, keep that in the back of your mind that you might not be able to go as diverse as you like, uh, but uh, we don't want the, the paddocks being taken over by weeds. Um, like I said, a simple little blends like this, hunter and Italian ryegrasses can go right into the late part of the seasons, keep growing. It's been grazed multiple times, just keeps coming back. Okay, and that, that crop right there was about $42 an acre, I think, somewhere around there and grazed multiple times and did really well. This is the first year I started doing multi-species and that's just Winford forage rape with oats. And that's when it was a game changer in our place for our winter um, management, keeping the cost down. There's another simple little one, a biannual. This is something that's gone into sod, okay? We've hit the sod up with Roundup and we've put winter triticale and sweet clover in. We seeded that in May. We didn't seed it in the fall and we're able to get multiple grazings off it. Last year, the winter triticale didn't survive that well with the drought because it went into, into the winter stressed from low moisture. And I've seen a lot of winter kill of trit, which normally doesn't happen. But because of the conditions last year, we did. But the sweet clover, that's the difference between our tap-rooted plants and our fibrous roots plants the tap roots can go down and start mining deeper into the soil, right? So it's able to trace down and find that little serica moisture where a, a grass has a, a fibrous root that kind of shallow and it, it'll get about the first six inches and that's about as far as it can go. But the following year, it'll go deeper. So we need to have that moisture. But there's a simple crop. If you're taking out old pasture stands, then use something like this. It's a great crop. Um, cheap that thing was about 30 28 to 30 dollars an acre and because of being a biannual you got two years out it so the following year after this crop was done it was uh, turned into green feed and then he went back into a winter swath grazing um, one thing about the brassicas every part of the plant the stem the leaf and everything is digestible even in the middle of winter, in the middle of December, that's at home uh, um, in the middle of December. Uh, those plants there, that time of year, were running 15% protein. And then um, I think it was a 65 or something TDM, the, the, the thing's coming up here in a minute. But then there's nothing left of it. But then with these um, cereals, they'll take the cream off like the heads, as you know, and the and the green leaves and they'll leave some stalk, which is nothing wrong with it, but just getting the best bang for your buck. 
here's the feed test. Okay, so it's 16% protein and 68 TDN. And the straight barley oats paddock was was 9.3 and 59. So this was um, $15 more per acre of seed, but we're able to get a hell of a lot of really good high value feed. So it limited my fence moves. So from 24 hour shifts to 36 hour shifts um, with the fence. So I was able to get more grazing days an acre out of that. And cattle can plow like this was fairly spring heavy crusty snow and these girls here know how to work they, they don't know anything but um how to go working for their feed so they're able to walk up and down and break open the snow and then they're able to go for it okay we're getting towards the end here this is um goliath forage rape so i got this seed up late 2014 and i just put in heather's vegetable garden this is why we've really got to consider the brassicas for uh, up here in Canada. So this photograph, you can see it was seeded in, in the middle of um, August there. We got our snow in the middle of September and pretty heavy snow, some frost after that. And I thought, well, she's going to be a write off. Um, but there's the 23rd of October. Those plants just got up and grew. It didn't hold back. We got enough warm afternoons. Um, they were able to keep growing, but this particular day is minus 15 and set them back and they end up dying off, um, but they stayed green uh, right up until the deer and the moose took them out in the, in the yard. But that's what I love about these brassicas that we can use more of here in North America, uh, in Canada, because we can see them late and with the right moisture and everything, um, we can still get really good bang for our buck. So you can take a silage crop off and, and you say, yep, I've got some moisture in my soil, uh, either irrigated or rainfall, and you can go and chuck something like this in. So this is $25 worth of, of seed and be able to get you that kind of, kind of growth, but we still need the fertility, right? This is up at Wills. Um, this, these plants can go very rapidly. Um, so this photo was three weeks later after um, that photo was taken. So you can see how it gets away. That's got some daikon radish in there as well. This is quack grass here, but your forage rapes and oats and stuff in there as well. And some residue. This is up at Jack Stalls, up at Manning. He grows this to give his perennial, um, perennial pastures a rest. This could have been grazed earlier. Don't let it get this far ahead of the cattle. Get it grazed down and then she'll go again, except the peas, they won't come back as we talked about earlier. This photograph here, all those white flecks in there on these rotting leaves and through here is all the fungi that's coming and taking all that back into the soil. Well, it's not taking in, it's just chewing it up and rotting and, rot, and the fungi rots in the soil. This is the regrowth. <coughs> um back in september so rapid regrowth um um what do, what, what do i need oh yeah so i cut this lot here and i left this lot stand and that's the amount of regrowth we got uh, about 30 days after it was cut that late in the season and saints that's that patch right there that's the same patch again italian ryegrass and the and the forage turnips Okay, getting to the end here. So something to consider when you're doing this, big emphasis on the soil, um, get your soil tests, see where you're at with it, um, what you need for fertility. You're gonna push your fertility down, um, but you're not gonna get rid of it. You're always gonna add something in there. Fit the forage to the livestock, could be sheep or cattle or pigs. Um, and then the length of the growing period. So I was showing you those early, those quick growing brassicas, um, something to consider after your, your, your main crops come off, um, but you can also seed them early and be grazed multiple times as well. Plan your seeding dates. You know, if you can get it in by the 1st of um, May for summer grazing, and if you're gonna go winter swath grazing, that should be in here about the end of May, June, for winter swath, so the oats and trit or cereals aren't that matured off. And then um, 
if you're a cropping guy and you want to get cattle on, you know, fit the crops and the cattle feed to what crop rotations are. You know, you might go cover crops one year and then go back to cereals uh, or canola to control the weeds. But anything you do, getting that livestock back on the soil, figure that out and make sure that you can get those cattle back on there. Always look at your, fit, um, your feed quality and uh, your digestible matter. Make sure your feed quality is up there. Animal husbandry, like we now normally, up until the last couple of years, we normally wean in January because our feed is so high quality. So um, keep your eye on the maintenance of your cattle. See that body scores keeping up in the threes. Um, so they're not mil uh, dropping away. And then um, manage the residue. Like I said, we don't turn our soil. We just let the soil take it in itself. And then feed allowances. Always look at your mineral packages and uh, make sure the feed quality is matching what those wet cows, dry cows, sheep, ewes, lambs, whatever you're going on. And then soil test, correct the problems. If there's something lacking and you're not getting the best bang for your buck, then look at your soil, get your feed, your agronomist or, or someone like that out to help you figure it out. And that's it. So yeah, that's kind of my, you know, 10 minute spiel. Um, things that, that weren't shared with me in the very beginning and, and it learnt the hard way. And I just want you guys to kind of, um, you know, learn from my mistakes, I guess, or whatever you want to say. Um, but it's, it's not, it's not as easy as what it, the, some people are making out to be out there. That's for sure. So, yeah, have we got time for questions there, Kayla? Yeah, thanks, Graham. Yeah, we do have time for questions. So I guess if you want to unmute yourself and ask them or just write it in the chat, that works too. Yeah, we got all night, I think. <laughs> oh, boy. Come on. PJ. PJ is from Turner, Montana. He's been doing this a long time. And Turner is a is semi-arid desert down there. And what he's doing down there, actually, you could probably tell it. Like, he's not doing everything we're doing here. He's doing got his own formula mixed um, out. So you, you want to share some of your thoughts, PJ? Yeah. Uh, so we... We run a lot of yearlings and uh, we're just, uh, we do that Montana dry land plan that Graham put together that grows in this country pretty well. And uh, we like to try to uh, finish our yearlings out in August, September on that green cover crop. Um, keeps them going on the gain. Of course, we're moving electric fence every day and uh, seems to be working, fills in that gap. You know, our native grass is pretty well matured out by then and uh hay fields are you know dried out also so that cover crop blend gives us a couple months extra for uh green feed grazing uh been working very well last couple of years uh been pretty dry not a lot of rain um it's short not a lot of uh growth to it but we have grazed it Basically, that was the only thing left green in this country by August, September. So um, we did do the winter swath grazing one winter. It was work just like Graham said. Uh, cows got out there and dug underneath the snow, and uh, they were happy. They weren't standing in the windbreak when it was 20 below. They are out grazing. So I'm a big believer in that for winter feed costs because uh, – Last couple of years, you know, hay's been up to $300 a ton around here. And I wish more people would look at that winter swath grazing because you can, the cheaper you can winter a cow in this country, the more money you're going to make. And uh, that's that's just kind of some low hanging fruit, that swath grazing. I just wish more people would look into that. I know they got to go out there and move a little electric fence, but it don't take long, but uh, works very well. 
Um, we have a few cows that we calve out in June. Um, I just weaned the calves yesterday off of them uh, June calving cows last year. They went through the winter fine. I mean, they're not fat, but uh, they'll calve again here in a month. And uh, grass is green. I'll kick them out. Calves off them were healthy. Didn't have to doctor any all winter. Had no sick ones. Um, so, yeah, that worked out good. Last year I weaned them in April, and this year I thought, well, I'll leave them on until May. I just got time to wean them, I guess. But, yeah, it's all good. Um, anytime you can leave that calf on the cow, keep it healthy. Uh, you know, on the feeder market right now, on them calves are probably 500-pound calves. It's red hot, so I uh, don't have much into them. It's kind of... Uh, Mother Nature's herd I'm running right now. Uh, but it's kind of kind of kind of exciting to, to do that, I guess, and it's been working for me. So yeah. Um other than that, I guess it's just kind of what we've been doing, playing around. I'm gonna seed some winter trade of kale this year with sweet clover and try that. Um Hopefully, instead of doing the uh, dry land mix, I'm going to do the winter trade of kale with the sweet clover and maybe get some fall grazing out of that for a yearlings and then uh, have that crop for next year. Just something I'm trying, something different, I guess, on the same same ground. We've been putting sorghum every year. We plant sorghum or cover crop or oats, swath grazing. So um, haven't sprayed this chunk of ground in over five years. and. Uh, Seems like the sorghum that we had planted in there, the, the next last year, it was a really clean field. Um, just different things like that that we've been noticing. So yeah, I guess it's all kind of a learning experience. Um, you know, Graham's uh, been a big help over the years and uh, everything uh, he's told me to do, it's worked out fine. So I got to give him credit. <laughs> So other than that, I guess. Checks in the mile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does any anybody else have any thoughts? Yeah, Graham. Hey, Tim. I was one, wondering, uh, as far as seeding the different types of uh, of crops, what, what options are there, like broadcasting the, mm. the smaller stuff and drills for the, for the cereals, et cetera? Yeah, exactly. D yeah, don't overthink it. Like, um, if, if whatever you've got, make it work. Kind of got like today. We we um, we're talking about just what he's going to do. He d he doesn't have a good enough precision drill. So what we're going to do is broadcast the seed, the small seeds on, and then the tool action putting his cereals down will have enough seed soil contact. But his centers are only on eight inch center. So that makes a difference. It'd be a hell of a difference if it was on 12 or 14 inch centers. So the, the um, uh, don't overthink it. If you can scratch that in, the small seeds at half inch and the cereals at half inch and your peas and your, and your sunflowers, because your highest value crop is in your smaller seeds, like your Italians and your clovers and your brassicas, and the others will follow. So um, I like, I get contractors in to do mine when I don't have time. So they've come in with the big flexi coils as long as Kevin puts it in a half inch. Um, and then I've got my AgriPower drill, which is um, a real precision drill. And if I have time, I'll use that. Um, if it's not out doing work, um, cause I contract that out. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't like, if you, even if you had cropland and you blew your seed on first and then lightly harrowed, say you had a Valmar and harrow and you Valmar, but you tip your tines back. So it's just tickling the seed in. Um, if you can see about five or 10% on top of the soil, then you're pretty much right. Um, but if you've got a machine that can get in, um, I, I like a disc opener or, or a small hoe point drill is, is definitely the way to go. But if you've got big gear, Treat it like canola. If you can grow canola successfully, you can go cover crops, no problems at all. What's warm species compete in it? 
the C4, like the um, the question is what warm species are in the your complete annual blend? It's a, it's a blend of three sorghums that we've been playing around with out of the States. Um, there's dwarf, brown mid rib and a sugar. So that's the three that is in there. It's a blend of three sorghum. So we're kind of buffering it. It's talking about sorghums. Um, we're trying to experiment. I see Anne on there. Um, we're putting, and this might work for you, PJ. Actually, you might have experience with this amount of sorghums you've got. Um, we're putting a perennial pasture stand down uh, uh, west of Cochrane. Uh, there's a lot of gophers in there, but we're putting uh, two pounds of sorghum down with it. Um, seeing if that'll work with the parasitic acid will kill the gophers. I've talked to uh, a couple of guys in the States about it and they, they've used it for mole control, moles, and um, they think it'll work with the gophers as well. So have you noticed that with the amount of sorghum you grow, PJ? Yeah, we uh, had that one 320 acre field that was uh, solid gophers, seeded straight sorghum one year. And uh, I tell you what, it was a definite, uh, you, you could see the difference in it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm a firm believer that it did something to the gophers. Yeah. So we'll be trying that up here and we'll keep that. We might, we'll post some pictures out later with foothills or something and see how that goes. So, um, I'm pretty confident in what we're doing and, and that, that, um, <clears throat> that, uh, couple of pounds of, um, sorghum in there cost, uh, $5 20 an acre. So when you've got a $60, $70 perennial stand, that might be the way to go, but uh, stay tuned for that. What about Graham, you? Graham, yep. we use, uh, we use your alternate mix quite a bit and uh, uh, you've always got the, it's, you've always had the coated stuff. Can we get some uncoated? Cause I've got some seed treatments I'd like to try. Sure. Yeah. Yep, the coating we have is N N and P and mycorrhizal and rhizobia. Yeah, you can get uncoated for sure. It's yeah. it's all the organic guys, they want the uncoated stuff. Yep. Yeah, okay, thanks. What about Glenn and Kelly? No. Okay. What cool. I uh, didn't see any difference in the gophers last year in the sorghum. Okay. Well, that was last year. What about this year, Randy? Oh, not coming. Okay. Well, if that's that's it, Kayla, has yeah. anybody else got any? There's a lot of people on here doing a lot of neat things. So Tim Barnes is doing some with Sherry and cam out there and ryan and and i know phil and all the other guys are, are doing neat stuff so it's it's building that community and and uh sharing the failures as well as the successes because it can cost you a shitload of money if you have failures that's for sure yeah okay right okay, well i guess if you guys think of questions later, you can write down yeah, Greg's email here. Or call me. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much for having me. And um, yeah. you're welcome to come at our place anytime and have a look around. And and there's some really neat people out there doing some great stuff. And um, just keep in mind the bottom line and don't skimp out too much. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone, for attending. And I will be sending this recording out in a couple of days. So, um, yeah, I will let you guys all go. Have a good evening.